program, Revealing the Truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and I've got a question for you. What do you think they're doing with your DNA? Oh, you know that DNA swab you sent off to 23andMe, and you were so excited to have your DNA compared to the millions and millions and millions and millions of others so you could find out who you were. Well, that goes into a database, and that database is something that someone is incredibly interested in. Now, it's not like you gave your personal identity and not like identity theft. It's not like you gave your social security number and your address and all your credit card numbers, but it is giving something that Satan himself is extremely interested in. And what he's interested in is to find out if you have a Y chromosome marker that says you're in the line of Aaron. Well, why does that matter? Because unless the lineage of Aaron returns and takes up the rightful place as the high priest, calling for the return of Jesus, Jesus doesn't come back. That's right there in the Bible, my friends, and contained within the pages of how Satan is trying to weaponize that DNA to take out the lineage that will keep him on the throne as prince of this earth. It's called the Codist, and it's out in the second edition. We sold out of the first edition. Second edition is out both in paperback and Kindle right now is just $2.99. Get this biblical thriller that is like none other. I also want you to visit our webpage, ignitinganation.com. Scroll to Special Offers. Click on the yellow cover of my latest book, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. I take you on a journey from the natural into the supernatural and show you seven particular parts of the tree, beginning with the ground, taking you all the way out to the fruit, where God is revealing supernatural truths. Now, when you click on that book cover, there's going to be a window that comes up. We're going to ask you for your email address. We won't send you spam because spam is not kosher, but we will send you the first chapter of this book. Get it today. It's my blessing to introduce you to Meg S. Miller, an influential speaker and multiple award-winning author with nearly a decade of writing experience who shares with us her latest book, Benefit of the Debt, How My Husband's Porn Problem Saved Our Marriage. She offers a unique perspective on porn addiction, bringing fresh insight into tackling, tackling sexual brokenness in Christian marriages. She, her husband Joe, and their three children live near Washington, D.C., where they own and operate an organic farm. You can learn more about her at www.benefitofthedebt.com. Meg Miller, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Meg, uh, I just want to honor you by saying that there is not enough resource in this area and that for you to be as transparent as you were in sharing your story, your struggle, and your passage truly to the other side yeah. of this incredible obstacle, one that has shattered marriages, broken homes, and has brought about an industry that is literally billions upon billions of dollars in revenue as if it was normal and okay. Yeah. And the Bible says that one of the four things in Acts chapter 15 that applies from the law of Moses to the Gentiles, one of the four, and there's only four, is abstain from sexual immorality. Pornography is sexual immorality at its very core. Yeah. So I thank you for sharing your story and know that it is a breakthrough piece of work on what God can do. But before we take a deep dive into this amazing book, why don't you share with our audience who Little Meg was and what your journey to faith was and all the key influences in your life. Like many young women watching or listening today, I was born and raised into a Christian home. My family was a family full of pastors. And I don't mean just pastors. These people were very powerful for the Lord. They knew their stuff. And it hit their heart. It changed them. And uh, they were all, uh, often traveling, um, musical, very musical people. We had the right and left brain engaged. They used logic as well as the arts to express what Jesus had done for them. It was genuine. It was not legalistic. There was, uh, it was so cool. It was so cool and rare, especially these days to grow up in a family like that. I was set up to expect this from everyone. <laughs> and as you can imagine, you know, there's a little bubble that, that burst at, at one point <laughs> throughout. So I knew the Bible. I knew um, what the Lord Jesus claimed about me. 
my inheritance. I knew what I was destined for, and I knew that I was adopted into a really great family uh, spiritually that I, I could never, I would never leave, you know, or never be let go from. So your, your faith was your own? Did you have did you have your own memory? Or do you have your own memory of when you really took full when you grabbed a hold of the handlebars when you yeah. had the training wheels, which was mom and dad and the family. Those were your training wheels. So you were really resting on them. You might, you were wobbly, but yeah, I was. You, you know, <laughs> but, but you were you were dependent upon them keeping you upright. But then yeah. the day came when the training wheels came off, and you had to own your own faith and navigate your own path. Do you remember when that was? Yeah, through my teen years, my late teen years, I was able to, they gave me wings as well as equipment. So they gave me all the tools I needed to go explore. And then they got on their knees and prayed, prayed that I would survive because I'm uh, like them. I am creative and logical. I'll question. Yeah. I, there's a half of a contrarian in me, you know, and I'll question everything. It ended up being my saving grace to be able to question my own heart but um, and they taught me that. But um, it, it took a lot of questioning and learning about other religions and just like so many young adults. You know, there are uh, veterans of the faith and warriors just on their knees praying young people to their own faith. The training wheels did come off in the late teens. And uh, I learned about <laughs> how God could save me from my sin. I mean, you know, the the sin that goes beyond the six year old who stole a pencil and the real sin of having hurt people. I, uh, I accepted the Lord at that time and his sacrifice for me. And I was, I thought it was great. Although I had never murdered anybody. I had never, there was a problem with my faith. And it was that I never really thought, I mean, the Lord saved me from a few petty, petty crimes. And so that's a problem when somebody comes to the cross, like this sounds good. Oh, there's, there's a problem there. And that was a storm brewing that carried over into my marriage is that I didn't believe I had sinned too much. I didn't believe I was the, as bad as that guy over there. You know, that's so interesting that we have as a society in America, yeah. we've um, appropriated certain sins as being the sins we're going to make the issues. Come on, uh, come on, yeah. Same-sex marriage. Well, that's going to be the sin issue of the day, and we're going to really fight right. that. Uh, um, abortion. You know, yeah. that's the sin issue of the day, and we're going to address that. And the Bible does not uh, have a hierarchy of sin. It says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of our righteousness is like filthy rags before the Lord. Now, I can tell you that out of uh, the uh, hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of churches that I've preached in, and I paint the picture of Jesus' bloody garments, uh, that he was taken outside the gates of Jerusalem because he was wearing our filthy rags and they were actually stained in blood as the Bible described the filthy mm -hmm. rags it was referring to. And that's mm -hmm. why he had to be crucified outside the city because he was no longer without blemish or spot. He I was now bearing that. the mm -hmm. sin of the world. He mm -hmm. was now covered with our filthy rags. And this is exactly the picture God wanted to portray. The scourging, yes, he was bruised, he was wounded, he was pierced, all for our transgressions and our iniquities. But he was clothed with our filthy blood red rags of our righteousness okay, laid upon his back to be carried out of the city because it represented the entrails, the bowels, the filth of humanity laid upon him. And when you understand that in that vivid picture, it doesn't matter what you've done. This is why you have to right. go to the Lord every day. Forgive us our debts. Right. As, forgive us our sins as we forgive others. I don't even know what I've done. Uh, there was a provision in the Old Testament for the Day of Atonement, which was for the unintentional right. sins of the nation. It wasn't about the deliberate. It wasn't about, it was about the one where I said something in passing I gave no yeah. thought to, but the other person heard it a different way. It hurt their feelings. I never knew right. that, that, that I had burst their bubble or that I had... <laughs> Okay. That's a, still a sin in God's eyes. He's the God of reconciliation, not the God of division. And so we just don't know. It's easy for us to fall into this trap. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's a huge trap. It is. Because we don't think that we need God the way we really need God. Uh-huh. 
And so what happens? We get distracted. And you know that the moment that you dwell on anything other than the Lord, that the enemy is victorious. When you take your eyes off of Jesus, when you take your eyes off of God the Father, then you're distracted with the ways of the world, the enemy wins. Every moment you shift your attention away, that's time credited to his, hey, uh, time for me to get paid. I've punched in on this life. I've punched, clocked, in on, clocked in on their life. I've clocked in. Uh, it's time for my reward. Here's all the hours that I've booked, all the overtime I've worked in the lives of all these people. So in this journey, you uh, go off and go to college? I went skiing. Ah. <laughs> and that was, you know, it's great because the um, natural creation, the, wor the being out there, I couldn't ignore the love of God. <laughs> we were, I was in Teton Valley, Wyoming, Teton Valley, Idaho, the Jackson Hole area. And it was too in my face, the creation and the, the weather patterns and the magnificence of the ability to ski and the way the body works. It was just, he was as the hound. He just hounded me with his love. The Lord followed me. It's like he was building up a well of, of love. He knew I would need it someday. I think. <laughs> well, that's great. So how did you yeah. meet your husband? We were snowboarding together and partying at night. <laughs> and uh, he was, he was not well um, spiritually. He was, he had his addictions um, to other things and, I didn't, at the time, I didn't care. He was fun, you know, so uh, we got married. <laughs> I knew the Lord and it was like, man, he's, he's my vending machine, the Lord Jesus, you know, and if I need him, he's there for me, but I, I'll, I'll marry this guy. And um, yeah, he, the, my husband did um, come, come to the Lord Jesus. We were, it's very, it's very, um, that area is full of more, a Mormon, high Mormon population. So it's very, um, surprising that we didn't fall into one of those churches just as open as we were. You know, we considered our openness a virtue. We were open to anything. Um, so a, a small four-square church out there, the summit in Teton Valley, scooped us up and really nurtured us into true intellectual knowledge of Christ and what he was doing in our hearts and what he could do for the world. And so then we started to follow the Lord Jesus in earnest. We were a Christian couple from then on, really, um, the kind that you hear about that really just jumps in every church, every church we go to, you know, the enigmatic couple that everybody loves and wants to volunteer. We were, we were a powerhouse for the Lord. <laughs> so you knew about his pornography beforehand? No, I just no. knew about other addictions. I okay. should have, <laughs> okay. I should have, you know, two and two. Right. But the other addictions were more, um, um, Mind altering, if you will. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, those were okay. Those were acceptable. And Isn't then, that interesting? You know, yeah. it, it, it's it, you know, it, it, I, I will tell you a natural, <laughs> supernatural kind of reference. Um, the airlines make you check your baggage, but you're still allowed carry on. <laughs> All right. So, so the big stuff, <laughs> all right, the big stuff, all right, you have to check. Okay. But yeah. you get to carry on. Yes. All right. In yeah. a secret. Okay. Not really runs through an x-ray machine, but really yeah. held close. Yeah. Always held very, very close. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can I help you with that bag? No, no. I, I'll, okay. I'll, 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 and it goes under my feet where mm -hmm. I can make sure that it's safe and secure. And that's exactly what you're describing. You yeah. knew about the overt baggage. You didn't know about the carry-on. And the Lord really did deliver him of the overt stuff. It was an, uh, a miraculous thing. And I assumed if anything was, was going to be carried on, it would be dealt with, you know, in time. And with he was involved in men's groups, and he seemed very healthy. So how, what, what, what really led to this discovery? Uh, he might have wanted to get caught, um, but we were married for about four and a half years, almost five years, and uh, I found, you know, a stash online. And when a, when a wife finds something, oh, I try to get her to stop snooping from then on out. You know, it, it was like, oh, what, what else do we have here in this house? 
And so the more I um, looked, the more I uncovered. And that was very sad and scary. And a, um, a lot of women watching or listening, uh, they know exactly. It's almost like a PTSD when they remember it and they hear me talk about it. When they hear a young woman talk about hurt, she's going through it. That uncovering stage, it, um, it's illimitably damaging. It's Im impossible to quantify for any 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 anyone who's ever been on this side of the receiving end of that discovery is really impossible to explain. And some women, they, they, they're able, you know, there's a uh, fear, anger, resentment. Uh, well, not usually resentment, but anger at first, which eventually can turn into resentment, but confusion. I thought we were good. Uh, I thought we were cool. I thought you had, I thought you were a leader in the church. This guy was counseling, you know, young couples. And it was like, it just didn't add up. And, um, Meanwhile, he, the discovery was liberating for him. He was thankful. He, yeah, he was worried about me, okay. So he was, um, wanted to uh, make sure I was going to be okay. He wanted to comfort me, He, but he was excited to be back in the position of delivering protector, and um, there was hope for him. There was healing available. There, He was free from the compulsion. He felt relieved. Now, Bethany, you know, Meg, you know, you know that this is happening. And so it's easy for him to, uh, relive it. It's hard for me. There was not an ounce of relief, not an ounce of hope. There was no freedom. That was scary because what else am I about to find tomorrow? If I, if he says, no, that's all. I, I promise you found everything. Um, then, you know, things continue to come up and that's even almost like now it's impossible to rebuild trust because you just told me now we're good and we're not. And, you know, there's um, sometimes it takes a few days. Sometimes it takes a few weeks. The younger wives are usually going through this because the older wives often have uncovered something before, you know, like this. It's almost but it's always an event. What else is there? There's this big conversation, you know, and often a man is like, oh, I'm so glad it's out. Now we can move on. And the wife is like, oh, what? Move on. How am I supposed to move on? You know, there's. Like you said, there's lots of tools available um, for men. There's often often books and curriculums for men, and women are a little bit um, left to flounder. It's it's difficult. What's out there um, is lacking. Why do you believe that your husband's porn addiction <laughs> saved your marriage? I mean, that's that, that, that that's that, you know. I, Listen, I, I get the PTSD, I get the, the uh, breach of trust, it is uh, adulterous, it is uh, sexual sin, um, it is actually uh, justified in the Bible and people will use that justification as the foundation for yep. a divorce action, say, yeah. uh, whether you cheat on me in, in w w right. with the computer or you cheat on me online or you cheat on me in a hotel room, it's all the same uh, uh, adultery. Uh, and, and the fact that Jesus said, if you even think, uh, look at someone and think, then yeah. you've committed adultery. So it's so much harder in the New Testament than it was in the Old Testament. You actually had to consummate the adulterous relationship. In the new economy, in the new covenant scriptures of the teachings of Jesus, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, he made it incredibly clear that uh, this is, is adultery. This is adulterous. So how can that be the salvation of a marriage? Well, that's a good question. It sounds so counterintuitive and it's rare that, uh, and it, the exposure of some kind of one of these events is uncovering could really do that for a marriage. It has to be supernatural, right? Uh, the, the way it saved my marriage is the same way. Um, uh, it was a wake up call for me. So I was living based on my own righteousness and I had no idea. My anger came from a place where I don't deserve this. I've done nothing wrong. You hear a believer say that, and you just, uh, you wonder, you know, those words, I don't deserve this, and I deserve better. I've done nothing wrong. I'm the innocent party here. Uh, those are not the words of someone who's at the feet of the cross, desperate for uh, forgiveness, which is where we should all be um, all the time. In the same way, so that's the answer. It was a wake-up call. But in the same way, if, if we had to put it into different, like, um, uh, different terms, I have a cousin who was, he was, diagnosed with cancer uh, a few years ago and 
And it was a wake up call for him. He's now the healthiest person I know. He knows everything about the vegan lifestyle. He knows about how the body works, how nutrition, he knows a lot, a lot about how nutrition contributes to or fights cancer. He is a powerhouse of knowledge for uh, this kind of clean living. And, and he loves his, the creation of his own body now. Same thing, you've, you've had somebody have a heart attack or stroke and never smoke another cigarette in their life, right? Or um, a husband or a, a daddy who misses that one recital and it's like, that was the wake up call. Some people change, others don't. You know, there's also the guy who got the diagnosis, he's just as, you know, smokes too bad, whatever. So um, this was a wake up call for me. I knew I needed to change, it, which is interesting because often, um, well, for the first year of after this discovery, I wanted my husband to change. He's got to change. But then I realized this is a wake up call for me. What if I need to change? I'm good. That's how, that's unfathomable. How could a good person need to change? <laughs> oh, so looking back, I'm so thankful that the Lord did not give up on me as the great counselor and continue to ask the odd questions that he does. Uh, do you want to get well? Who do you say that I am? Interesting questions that uh, uh, almost a, a counselor should be asking. Many don't. Many counselors, unfortunately, offer support, encouragement, comfort, the validation. And uh, so, yeah, I know it's tempting to do that because it looks like this spouse didn't do anything wrong. So I can see where it's coming from. However, the world has offered women plenty of encouragement. The world continues to offer women comfort, support, a platform, a voice. They're giving women everything they need that you're that you that looks like the answer. The answer is those questions that the great counselor with a big C can really ask. Only he has the ability to get to the root of the issue. Why are you so hurt? Amen. Amen. It's so interesting you define that when you go to a doctor and he presses on your abdomen to look for uh, where it hurts. He always goes a second time to the exact same spot that he found out where it was because now he wants to find out why it hurts. Mm -hmm. And this is the process that God wants to take us through is when we're hurt, we shouldn't be looking at the other person. We should be asking ourselves the question, press me again there, O oh Lord, and let me find out why that hurt. <sighs> we're talking with Meg Miller, author of Benefit of the Debt, how my husband's porn problem ruined slashed out, saved our marriage. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to hear more of the wisdom of this wife whose marriage was redeemed in spite of her, her husband, and their lack of a true mm -hmm. transformative relationship with the Holy One of Israel. We'll be right back. The Truth. Seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the Books and Media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage, and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial-free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live four-hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support 
and tax-deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the Donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we. Hello and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Meg Miller, author of Benefit of the Debt, How My Husband's Porn Problem Saved Our Marriage. Meg Miller, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Meg, when we were heading off into break, it kind of occurred to me that you are certainly doing a wonderful, amazing self-reflection uh, as to what role you played in your own faith journey that might have allowed some of these behaviors to continue uh, because of your personal relationship with the Lord, uh, establishing a strong, safe, healthy environment in the home and all those things. But I want to be very clear that, that uh, nothing you're saying says that you were in any way responsible for your husband's pornography addiction. Not at all. Not at all. He, what he does is up to him, and I believe God gives him everything he needs to fight every battle. And even if I were the most critical unkind, mean, ungrateful wife, it would not give him the out and the excuse to look elsewhere for his kicks. It, it is um, not something I am capable of doing, of taking away all his ability to do the right thing. No, he's able to do the right thing without me. <laughs> you bring up maybe one of the most significant spiritual lessons of all, and that is, is that we are responsible for our own relationship with the Lord. And in any effort we ever make <clears throat> to change someone else, we are actually interfering with the Creator and telling the Creator, 
uh, Lord, change my husband because you made him wrong, and the way you're handling him is not right, and you are not getting him where he needs to go, and so you need to listen to me, Lord, and this is what he needs, and I want you to mete out judgment upon him, and I want you to do this, and you need to change his heart, and you need to change this about him and change this about him. That's honestly manipulation and witchcraft, and it's spoken of in the Bible. Uh, exactly that way. So when the prayer we lift up is a twofold prayer, Lord, let there be change, but let it begin with me. And Lord, help me to see my spouse through your eyes, not through my natural eyes, because right now he looks like a pile of organic yeah. material to me that we use on the farm to raise our fruits and vegetables. And so, <laughs> you know, Lord, you're going to have to clean my lens. You're going to have to really wipe the filth away because I can't see him now the way you see him. And I need to have my eyes checked and I need to have my prescription changed. And this is what you are are working through and working yeah. with. So now, if the Lord answers that prayer, often it's it's much more common. The first description of, you know, God change my husband, and or God give me what I need to change my husband. <laughs> you, you know, those those prayers are much more common than change me. And um, in fact, my first change me prayer was change me and make me less hurt. Make me stronger so that his sin doesn't hurt me so much. And he didn't, the Lord Jesus, graciously, he did not answer that prayer either. He waited and he continued to let me ask hard questions and pray and pray a different prayer to see which one would unlock the answer that I was looking for, which is change me really from the root. He eventually did in a rush of insight, but it took a year of asking um, the wrong questions. Now, the benefit of asking the wrong questions and still begging God to change your husband is that you're still talking to the Almighty. He still lets you into the throne room to ask those wayward questions. And that is a benefit that wives get, even if you're off course, or even if you're, um, even if you're um, self-righteously praying for someone else's behavioral change and not that compassion that you were talking about. Uh, he's still he's still willing to wait with you through that. And that is something that should be sufficient for all of us, <laughs> you know, that he would give us that time and that attention. So using your personal experience, you found um, a way to identify hidden problems. What do you consider the number one reason why couples struggle with finding the kind of resolution that you found? A lot of lay counselors and, you know, the mentors that the women, okay, so when a woman ex finds these, is, is exposed in her home, she has, a, unfortunately today there are a lot of case studies. She can look at that woman or look at that woman because they went through it. She knows that person went through it. So she has all these abil the ability to look at a lot of other women. And unfortunately, there are a lot of women on display who are either bitter or walking with a limp for the rest of their lives. So the number one reason people fail to kind of, or the church fails to women on this, is that they'll rail, they'll rail on the evils of pornography all day and comfort and coddle the wife. I don't say that the first part is wrong, but I do say the first that, that the wife's feelings should be examined in the safety of Christian counseling with, a, you know, the big C, the big counselor, the, the great counselor in the room as well, so that he can say, ask again, ask a different question, ask, ask another one, because that rush of insight and the ability to see your husband as the, as the way that the Lord sees him, it's there. It's totally available to us. Uh, it's just going to take a lot of perseverance from the more self-righteous you are, wife, <laughs> the more it's going to take of, of asking again and asking again, but he will show you. And when he does, it might undo you. It might, it might <laughs> annihilate everything you ever thought about the temptations that men face. Uh, but it, I'm telling you, there's no turning back. I can never unsee now how I, how I saw my husband through the Lord's eyes for the first time. And all I want now is his success. Now I don't want him to pay for what he's done. I don't want him to change. I don't want, I just want him to succeed with all that he has, all the temptations and all, including me, you know, I'm throwing 
uh, fuel on the fire um, one way or the other to either be faithful or not so faithful. It doesn't matter. I just hope and pray now that I've seen him the way the Lord sees him, that he just succeeds all I want. And you can tell, you can tell that same relief that I told, I told you about earlier and freedom, sense of liberation that a husband has, sense of hope when a, an addiction is exposed. I have that now. I don't have the anger and the resentment and the, because the Lord answered me finally. Gee, I took a year of begging him because of my own walls. It, t- it takes a long time. If you have, if you're as, as set in your ways as I was and um, asking for a behavioral change like I was, Anyway, it, it takes a while, but once he did, I'm telling you, there's no turning back. I think about it every hour. This was like seven years ago. I think about it every hour, how the Lord sees my husband. So the number one way that uh, I don't think, I think that um, the church has, has lost the belief, the, the belief that a woman can get there, that she can actually see. I think they've, they've given up on a lot of women and said, she'll never see him the way the Lord sees him. And when she does, I mean, uh, it's possible. Don't give up on us. Don't encourage us if we've had encouragement. If you, Once we have encouragement and support and comfort, help us ask hard questions, please, because the revelation is there for us to see him that way. It's a gift. And we're not just talking about forgiveness. We're talking about the full package. We're talking about forgiveness. We're talking about reconciliation. We're talking about being <laughs> stronger. At You know, the logical mind says, yeah, I can understand that you have to be healed at the broken places. Well, you have to be broken first in order to be healed. Yeah. Jesus came to bind up the broken hearted and set the captives free. You have to fill in the blanks. What are you captive to? What does your heart break for? Because mm-hmm. God's heart breaks for what breaks your heart. God contends with what contends with you. And so if you just understand and grab a hold of this, bind up the brokenhearted, meaning all of us, every one of us have that broken place that God wants to knit it back together yeah. again. And what he knits to back together again won't ever break in that place yeah. again. Okay? <laughs> it's now immutable. It's now irrefutable. It's now immovable. It is now, it, 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 it's unbreakable. Okay? It is. And when, it he, is. And when he set whom, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. These are the words of Scripture. These are not my words. These are the words of God Himself, and they apply to this very circumstance because you can't <laughs> get you can't get to where you are healed and whole. You have to be broken and let God repair the vessel the way He wants to so He can hold all of Him. We're all these tiny little vessels that have to really get through this process of the refiner's fire, the burning off of the dross, creating a new vessel that he's the potter or the clay. Well, you heard that preached a thousand times. Well, guess what? You only (laughs) find that out when you drop the the pot. And now, uh, what is it? We're fractured, okay? But God makes it so that this vessel that's leaky, he's the one that puts it back together again. We are the Humpty Dumpties of the faith. And that's exactly what happens when we fall off the wall and then God puts us back together again. Man can't do it, okay? No. That's the Humpty Dumpty story. That's the gospel of Humpty Dumpty. It is that, <laughs> it is that all the king's soldiers and all the king's men could not put Humpty no. Dumpty back together again. But God can. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened in your life. So. When you understand, as you did, about uh, repayment of a debt, walk us through this scenario that you give in the book um, about what it means to pay off someone's debt. Uh, How does that apply to conflict in marriage? How does that apply to this situation? It's kind of mind-bending. Uh, but when someone sins or someone does something to hurt someone else, uh, a debt is incurred. And uh, the loving, almighty God who has an unending bank account has a problem because he loves us all so much. And he's paying our debts for, you know, the when I sin against, I sin against my husband, um, you know, I, let's say I do, I do sin against my husband. 
Um, I have hurt him and, and God. I go to God and I say, I'm so sorry. And God's like, it's gone. No problem. I, pay, I'm pay, I paid it on Calvary. Um, but I go to my husband and I say, I'm so sorry. And he's like, uh, I forgive you. He doesn't have a bank account like God does. So he says, I forgive you, but mm, someone's got to pay. Either he pays in small increments by living with that memory of me hurting or the cumulative effect of me hurting him over and over and over. A human has a limited amount of forgiveness in his heart, but God is able to both pay my debt when I say, sorry, God, yeah, I sinned today. He's also able and willing to pay my debt to my husband. And so <laughs> when my husband sins against me, and let me tell you, <laughs> our, our, our debts are so big. And the bigger they get against one another, the more fun it is to see God wipe them out on our behalf. I don't just get forgiveness from God. I also get forgiveness from my husband by way of God's illimitable riches of forgiveness. And now, how does that work? Well, all my husband has to do is look again at his debts and mine are paid. That feeling of you owe me, it goes away when you look at how much you have owed and you don't anymore. It goes away. Uh, do you remember the parable of the woman? Oh, I bet you do. <laughs> the parable of the woman who anoints joy Jesus' feet with the most precious oil and, dry and washes his feet with her tears and dries her his feet with her hair. And uh, the Pharisee, who really he might have been, uh, he might have been forgiven a few debts in his life, just like just like I was, you know, early on in our marriage. I I've been forgiven of some stuff. Yeah, I love Jesus. Yeah, he's in my house, right? I'm eating dinner with him, but I'm not I'm not falling all over his feet, you know, giving him my most precious thing. Why? Because I haven't been forgiven of much yet. But then when I do have that revelation that we talked about, that revelation and the rush of insight and the aha moment, this is different. This is, the, oh, this is different. I am she. And when I am, that's different. I understand when he, what he's saying. She loves much. She's been forgiven much for she loves much because of how much she's been forgiven. Now, when I look at my debts, I feel like her. I don't feel like the Pharisee anymore. And uh, this might be you know, a bunch of feeling stuff, but I'm telling you, it's the best to know that you've been forgiven of a huge thing instead of trying to forgive someone else of their tendinary. People who cannot forgive <clears throat> have forgotten what they have been forgiven of. That's right. And when we look at this message of God that uh, when asked Jesus, how should we pray? This is how you should pray. Forgive us our debts as we forgive others who have trespassed against us. It's a balancing act of every day of, listen, forgive me, pay my bill, and pay my friend's bill. It is this, listen, to drive through, I want to pay for the car behind me. Drive through, I want to pay for the car behind me. This is what the daily prayer is all about. This is why we have to go to the Lord each and every day. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. And then all this other stuff, this life stuff, this baggage stuff, this carry-on stuff, all these things are going to be yeah. taken care of and given unto you if you'll just walk yeah. with me. And God's not asking you to do more for Him. No. He's mm -hmm. asking you to do more with Him. And this is the model that you're given. Now, Part of the core of this problem is that men are quite visual and women are quite auditory. And I think in, uh, uh, before we went live, I shared with you uh, how men talk. Men say, do you see what I'm saying? I, and how can I see what you're saying? You're saying words. I can hear what you're saying, but you express it as we do our love languages in our own terms. So our terminology is, do you see what I'm saying? And that's a very common phrase for a man to say. What does a woman say? Are you listening to me? I know you hear me, but are you listening? So women are auditory, men are <laughs> visual. And so where are the traps for men? The eye gates. The eye gates are their trap. And it's quite interesting that the very narrow description of temptation versus sin is that 
for a man, a pretty girl walks by your path. You're not responsible for a pretty girl to walk by your path, but you are responsible for where your eyes go once she passes. What happens next? Right. <laughs> the temptation is a pretty girl. But if my eyes and head follow that pretty girl, and I'm in, in a uh, monogamous relationship, in a marital relationship with my wife, then I have violated the sanctity of that because I've taken one step yep. over the line. The journey over the line is instantaneous. The journey to the other side, the journey back, could take an incredible amount of work. So knowing where the lines are, you do it on the highway by nature, by learning when you learn to drive, you learn how to stay in your own lane. Okay, the first couple of years of your journey with the Lord, you hope you're staying in. You hope you're yeah. going. You hope you're going <laughs> north. That's all you know. I hope I'm going north. Okay. Then you start to learn where the boundaries and the yeah. bumpers are, and then you start to work your way in, and you try to shed that old skin and 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 become the new wine and the new wine skin concurrent with pouring out the old wine and realizing that I'm a hoarder when I decide to hold on to the old wine skin and try to put new wine in it, that's nothing but spiritual hoarding because uh, I can't let go of this part of me. So what advice would you get, want to give to women who are currently facing the same issue in what they feel is they're feeling hopeless and they feel violated? Mm, yeah. You have been violated, women, and... Um that's not an illusion. There are so many things and so much confusion. Pornography has a way and the exposure of it in your home has a way of confusing everybody. Everybody. And there will be a lot of thoughts that come into your mind that are not accurate. Don't trust every thought that comes into your mind. He is a scumbag. He's a weirdo. This is disgusting. He's hopeless. Stuff like that. Um, there's a, other, other things where I just need this or that. I just need to get out of here for a few minutes. I just need some time alone or I just need a drink. I just need one thing or another. No, you just need Jesus and he's right there with you and it's okay to just need that. And when you do get alone in your prayer closet and it sounds like an echo chamber, like there's nothing happening, I promise you, it is. Something is happening in your own heart. The fact that you're in your prayer chamber instead of with your girlfriends bashing him, is, uh, is miraculous. I promise you something huge is happening. I promise you. And if you stay there, it took me so long to, and so much, I would not give in to the fact that I think I might just be a little bitter for the rest of my life. Just a little. No, don't, don't give into it. So my advice would be to learn to sort out the lies from the truth in your own mind please. Uh, there's a book called Satan and his kingdom. It teaches us what the little things, you know, Satan's not going to come and say, uh, your marriage is over. If it's not, he might say you're just living with a, re a weirdo, a creep. And that's almost, that's more toxic. He knows better than to come at the overt ways. So, um, learn to, to recognize his, his lies and then learn what scriptures can combat those lies. The truth is way more powerful. If you just embrace it, take the time to do this homework. It is, it is so imp important. Learn also, um, all the questions in your scripture reading, find every, find and highlight in your Bible, every question Jesus asks every single one and ask yourself in your quiet time with him in his presence so that he can say, yeah, you're on the right track or ask again or keep trying because uh, he is a God of self revelation and he is so kind to give us these things. And then the last thing I would say is when it comes to when you will, if you do these things, you will have that <laughs> rush of insight and the ability to see um, your husband as the Lord Jesus sees him. And when you do remember that, your own struggle, you need to know that you're also struggling with sin. It doesn't look like it because you're self-sacrificing all day, you know, getting the kids off to school, wiping bottoms, breaking up fights, supporting your husband in his business, helping him get the right shoes to wear today, um, administering the household and, and being a good citizen. You're volunteering most of the time. You're in the church. You're saying yes to all the things. Women often rely on those things to miss the greatness of their sin. And when that happens, I'm telling you, you're, it's a breeding ground for trouble. And so if you don't struggle as hard as he does with porn, if you don't struggle with something, then you have laid, you have laid down and let that thing roll over you. Imagine him doing that with porn. So please 
find your own sin and root it out. The same intensity that you were looking for all the materials, what else has he been doing around here? Look in your own heart and in your own house, what have I been doing? What have I been doing against the Lord Jesus that I should not be doing and that is putting me in chains and my whole family in chains without realizing it, racking up debts I'll never ever ever be able to pay. Please root out your own sin. Ask the Lord, show me. Because you you won't be able to find all of it. And when he does, if he answers that prayer for you, you'll be completely healed immediately because the cross fixes everything he shows you. He'll show you your sin. What a gift to see your sin. That's the benefit of the debt. When I say I'm, I'd rather have had a great sin forgiven than never to have sinned at all, I mean it because I am the captive set free. And I'm telling you, there's hope. Look at me. I can't, I can't stop. I can't shut up about it. You know, I'm too excited. I'm too happy for what the Lord gave me. And it's available for every woman. Unfortunately, we're given encouragement and comfort. And I'm, yeah, those are great. A, cu- a cup of warm tea is nice, but goodness, sister, there is so much there for you. And it's in the presence of the Lord oh, Jesus. It's, it's in my book. You'll see what, you'll see what I did. He, and be, you'll have to be within a, in the biblical community as well, because uh, as you, Things will come up as you read my book. You'll be like, what? You have to have a pastor there averse in the scriptures. Please get into a, um, a Christian community there where someone is biblically informed. Well, you have a compelling message. Uh, the bottom line is, is let he who is without sin yeah. cast the first stone. And uh, this is a process that when you come to the crossroads that Meg Miller came into in this book, Benefit of the Debt, she chose the ancient path, which is what Jeremiah's message to uh, all of us is, is when you come to the crossroads, choose the ancient path, and there you'll find your peace. She not only has peace, but she has joy. Even in the face (laughs) of something that would devastate so many, she found that peace that passes all understanding, and she shows you how within these pages that you can have what she has. And if you've watched her face, if you looked in her eyes, if you heard her voice, you know that she has not been healed, she's been made whole. And she's been made one with the one who made her and his only begotten son that the only way that you can survive is to thrive in the kingdom of God with the intercessor there who sent the comforter, the Holy Spirit, to guide you, lead you, and direct you through every one of your challenges. This is but one challenge, but the solution is the same for every addiction, for every problem you have. This is not just about pornography. That is just the sin du jour. Uh, I'm sorry, but this is a recipe not for perfection, but for change to begin with you. Meg Miller, thank you for sharing benefit of the debt with us and how your husband's porn addiction saved your marriage. God bless you, <laughs> my friend. Thank you. It's God been you. fun. Thank, Thank you. you. That brings to an end our live broadcast day, but that doesn't mean we go off the air. We rebroadcast our programs 24 hours a day, seven days a week to over 190 countries around the world. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and right here at IANBN.com, IgnitingNation.com of the Igniting Nation Broadcasting Network. Well, watch both our programs, Revealing the Bible at the 9 o'clock hour and Revealing the Truth from 10 o'clock till 1 o'clock p.m. Until we see you back here in our studios live tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. right here from Birmingham, Alabama, we bid you shalom.